You know, as we turn to our psalm this morning, I, I do feel like I should start out by apologizing right from the, the outset about our music this morning. I, I warned Jerry I was going to apologize because Jerry picks our song. Jerry did nothing wrong. He did everything. He did a fine job picking out our songs this morning. Still, I, I feel a little bit bad about our music today because... I try to plan out my sermons uh, down the roadways, and I, I set a musical theme that will match the theme of the psalms, well, or whatever the sermon will be. As I was planning for this psalm, I knew we have absolutely nothing in our hymn book that matches the theme of this psalm. There's nothing Jerry could do about it. He has nothing to work with. So I, I didn't even really try to line up directly because we couldn't. We just came close in the idea of... of of God's care for us, but there's no songs that would fit the theme of our psalm. Now, today is Palm Sunday, as I've already indicated in my prayer. This is the day that traditionally we remember that our Lord entered Jerusalem to those shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna, and the palm branches five days before his death. We are going to have a Palm Sunday sermon today to focus on that, but that sermon will be tonight. So you have to come back tonight for that. In fact, the sermon tonight will look at Palm Sunday from a different angle than we usually look at it. We're not turning to one of the Gospels. We're continuing our series through Zechariah, which happens to be a Palm Sunday sermon. So come back this evening for that. This morning, as you can see on the screen, we're in Psalm 88. If the second to the last psalm in our series through the third book of the Psalter, my plan is to begin working our way through the Gospel of Luke after we finish Psalm 89. I should warn us that our music won't always match our sermon's themes then either because when you go through the Gospel of Luke, we'll be in certain themes for a long, long time and probably kind of exhaust what our hymn book has, so we might vary a little bit as we go, but, but it won't be quite like today. Our psalm this morning is one commentator that I read this week suggested is the saddest psalm in the entire Psalter. Uh, another commentator talking about Psalm 89 commented that there is not a single note of hope anywhere in this psalm. There is not a word of praise found within the verses that, that we're considering this morning. And frankly, we do not have any hymns in our songbook that sound like this. That, that do not contain words of hope and words of praise. Our, our songs are largely happy songs. When, when we gather for worship, we, we celebrate what Christ has done. We, we sing about his victory. We sing about God's majesty. We, we, we sing about our sure salvation that we have. We really don't sing about endless pain and sorrow. And yet here we have a song that, a psalm that does exactly that. In the Hebrew songbook, remember the psalms are the Hebrew songbook. The psalter is what they collected. That's what they used to sing with. Here we find a psalm that is endless pain and sorrow. No happy thoughts in this psalm. It's not a happy psalm. Yet, our psalm this morning is an inspired psalm. It's here in, in the word of God, by the inspiration of God, for the people of God. It's a psalm of faith. It's a psalm that, that, despite being a psalm of pain, is a psalm of faith for God's people. It's a psalm of confidence, despite being a, a psalm of frustration, a psalm of confidence for God's people. We need this psalm in what it teaches us. My, my plan this morning is to break the psalm into two sections. From these sections, I want to learn three simple ideas as we look at this psalm, as the superscription tells us from the sons of Korah. The sons of Korah have given us this inspired set of words. So we want to hear the psalmist now as he calls out to God in prayer from a life that, that's filled with pain and sorrow. 
Our three ideas are not complex this morning. It, as you know, oftentimes the ideas that I, I express tend to be a little lengthy in their statements. Such is not the case today. Very simple ideas. The first idea, life is hard. Life is hard. For many of you, this is probably one of those no da. You fully well know life is hard. You've lived long enough to know life is hard. You live with the hardness of life every day. You live with constant pain. You, you live with constant disappointment. You, you live with constant stress and fear. Life is hard. But do you bring complaints about the hardness of life to your God? That's what we find our psalmist doing in the first nine verses of the psalm. In, in the midst of, of despair, our, our psalmist calls out to God. O oh Lord, the God of my salvation, I have cried out by day and in the night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. My soul has had enough troubles and my life is drawn near to Sheol. I am record am among those who go down to the pit. I have become like a man without strength, forsaken among the dead like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you, you remember no more and they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the lowest pit, in dark places, in the depth. Your wrath has rested upon me, and you have afflicted me with all your waves. You have removed my acquaintances far from me. You have made me an object of loathing to them. I am shut up and cannot go out. My eye is wasted away because of affliction. I have called upon you every day, O Lord. I have spread out my hands to you. O oh Lord, the, the covenant name by which the, the psalmist knows God personally is placed emphatically as the very first word in this psalm, Yahweh. In the original Hebrew, Yahweh, the covenant name for God, rings out. Yesterday we had a work day. I, I do thank all of you that came out. We had a good turnout for our work day, but... Three of the people who turned out for a work day were the love kids. They were here helping out, and at one point, Owen wanted Liz. He, he wasn't sure where sh she was. So, so what do you think Owen did? He yelled as loud as he could down the hall, Mom! After all, Mom is the name he knows her by, right? That's the picture that comes to my mind here as the psalmist calls out to God. He is emphatically using the name that he knows God by and he's calling as loud as he can to get God's attention. He knows God is his covenant God. He knows God is his saving God. In fact, immediately after the personal name of God, he says, God of my salvation. God is the one who possibly has delivered him in the past. At the very least, he knows God is the one who can deliver him now. From the second line on, however, there is no mention of, of any past salvations that the psalmist may have experienced. Nothing from the hand of God that he references in the past that is positive. Instead, what we have is a litany of complaints, a, a list of the things that make life so hard for the psalmist. I, I want to just note four of them as they are mentioned in, in various ways in these verses. Four things that, that make his life hard that... I'm sure will resonate with, with us. Number one, God seems ambivalent. That's the first thing he, he mentions. The psalmist has serious problems, but as far as he can tell, God is ambivalent to any of them. We, we sang the song, Does Jesus Care? Well, the psalmist is saying, God doesn't care. God seems ambivalent. Forming that, that dreadful thought, that, that becomes the hardest thing in his life that the psalmist faces. He find, it finds first place in his list here uh, among all the hard issues of life, but it's also the most repeated idea. Look, look at verse 1. I have cried out by day and night before you. The implication is that he has not given up calling out to God, but there's no indication that the God has any response. 
In fact, verse 2 is a plea to God to listen. That, that word that we have translated as cry, that, that, that's a, a word that, that means loud shout. Just like Owen called out to mom. He used every ounce of his voice to, to express it. That's what the psalmist student here get God's attention. The difference between Owen and our psalmist is that when Owen cried out, Mom, Liz called back, here I am. The psalmist hasn't heard any such response from God. Look at verse 9. The psalmist repeats the idea. I have called upon you every day, O Lord. I have spread out my hands for you. The bottom line is that even though he has not ceased calling out for God, he feels forsaken by God. As far as he can tell, God is ambivalent to his plight. Life is hard. Life is hard, yet nothing is harder in life than the thought that God doesn't care about what he is going through. This is not the sort of thing that, that we tend to talk about when we gather for church or when we get together as, as Christians. We, we don't tend to see, talk about God doesn't care about me as acceptable church conversation. We don't actually say it seems that God is ambivalent. But that doesn't mean that we don't feel that way. And when we start to feel that God is ambivalent, everything else becomes much more crushing. We can endure a lot when we know someone cares. But when we start to think that person doesn't truly care, it hurts more. And when that person is God, it tops our list of pain. Number one, God seems ambivalent. Number two, the psalmist says, the second thing on his list is, problems abound endlessly. Problems abound. The, that's the second item on the list. I, I'm just summarizing because what we have is a list of, of complaints about real problems that the psalmist has in his life. He, he really has problems. He doesn't give us specifics about his personal problems, but in verse 3, he assures us that he has troubles. In verse 9, he calls them afflictions, real issues, in other words. In fact, I, I appreciate the way he expresses himself in verse 3. He says, my soul has had enough troubles. In other words, he is full up in the trouble department. I have had enough. I am fully satisfied when it comes to problems. We also can conclude from verses 3 and 4 that his problems are serious enough that they've sapped his physical strength to the point where things are life-threatening. Whatever's going on, he has faced and is facing real problems. Add to that the fact that he continues here to cry out to God about them and that indicates that his problems are continuing. These are not problems of the past. These are now problems. Again, I, I don't think I have to work too hard to convince any of you that, that problems abound endlessly in life. All of us have lived long enough to have that experience. Within this past week, we've been praying for a church member who had to cancel a surgery. Look at Brian over here. Cancel a surgery because even more urgent medical needs have come up. And he's going to have to have his jaw wired for six weeks minimum. We prayed for another church member, Violeta Dongan, as she had to suddenly make a trip to help care for her daughter-in-law, Bonnie, who's going to have a number of cancers, or treatments for cancer, beginning with surgery. We have others in our church recovering from surgery. It's great to see Deb Elwood walk in, but she's still dealing with pain from her surgery. Cheryl Bjork, we know, is not here this morning. There, the list goes on. Margaret Ayudo is not back with us yet. In the physical area of life alone, we, we know problems abound endlessly. Plus, we all know there are countless other problems that, that drain our energy and, and tax our willpower. You know, things like crabby kids and, and broken appliances and derailed projects and hostile neighbors and expensive needs and on and on. The curse of sin has left such a mark on this world that we have problems everywhere we turn. 
Certainly, we can share the, the psalmist's issues that, that life is endlessly full of pain from problems. We would put problems on our list just like he did. Number three, friends abandon when needed. Verse 5, the, the psalmist pictures himself as, as an unknown body lying in, in a mass grave somewhere. Not a pleasant thought, but that's how he sees himself. I'm just a body lumped in with many, many other bodies in a mass grave after a battle or something. Totally forsaken, unknown by any living person. In, in verse 8, he, he goes on and he accuses God of, of taking all his acquaintances away because God has turned him into someone who is shunned by the living. Poetically, these are just ways the psalmist is expressing he is alone. All of his companions have left, leaving him as, as someone to be avoided now. It, it doesn't matter how great his need is. He, he's treated by others as if he's become an abomination. Now, if you have ever been abandoned by a friend in your time of need, you know how painful this feels. You know the emotional cut that comes with, with abandonment. You know how loneliness is, is often more painful than the physical ailments themselves. Life is hard. Friends abandon when needed. Life is hard. Number four, add to this, not only is God ambivalent, God appears antagonistic. God appears antagonistic. Verses 6 and 7, they ratchet things up a notch from ambivalence. The ambivalence is in the first couple of verses, but look at these verses. You, God, you have put me in the lowest pit. Your wrath has rest on me. You have afflicted me. God, you are against me. The psalmist turns his lament of pain into an accusation. God has directly caused the current hardness of his life. You have put me here. Your wrath has rested on me. This is past tense language. God, you have already done these things. It's God's fault that I'm in this state. God has done things that leave the psalmist feeling as if he's being treated just like he expects God to treat the wicked. He expects the wicked to have a hard time. He expects God's wrath to go on them, but he feels like he's reaping the same thing. God is so antagonistic toward him that he uses the picture here of waves breaking over him, one after the other, except these are waves of affliction instead of waves of water. Do you ever feel like anywhere you turn, everywhere you turn, there's another wave hitting you? Romans 8.31 says, If God is for us, who is against us? The Apostle Paul gives us that as an expression of great encouragement. And it is encouraging, isn't it? If God is for us, who is against us? But what if it appears that God himself is antagonistic toward us? Where do you look for encouragement then? What if all you can see is wave after wave after wave of hardship? We know that God controls all things. We know that there is no accident. But that means that when the waves keep coming, God is behind them. Life is hard. Life is hard. That's the simple idea that, that we can conclude from the, the first half of our psalm. Not a happy thought, just simply life is hard. You know, there's this equally simple idea that, that we can conclude from the second half of the psalm. Death approaches. Death approaches. Life is hard, death approaches. Again, this is pretty much one of those no-da type ideas. We understand that death is approaching. We, we've lived with death as a constant reminder in, uh, in our lives. It's a reality we, we can't avoid. We've all attended funerals of loved ones. We've all experienced the reality of death in some fashion. Many of us have probably 
Well, with not even probably, I know for a fact, many of us have sat beside the bedside of loved ones as, as death approaches. Some of you may have been the person on the bedside that thought death was approaching. Struck down by some severe ailment, sensing that death was approaching, and yet somehow you were spared at the last moment. Death approaches. Listen to our psalmist expressing this idea, picking up our, our reading here in verse 10. Will you perform wonders for the dead? Will the departed spirits rise and praise you? Will your love and kindness be declared in the grave, your faithfulness in Abaddon? Did your wonders, will your wonders be made known in the darkness and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O Lord, have cried out to you for help, and in the morning my prayer comes before you. O oh Lord, why do you reject my soul? Why do you hide your faith from me? I was afflicted and about to die from my youth on. I suffered your terrors. I am overcome. Your burning anger has passed over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. They have surrounded me like water all day long. They have encompassed me altogether. You have removed lover and friend far from me. My acquaintances are in darkness. Our psalmist feels the nearness of death. He, he can sense his approach in his life. Again, I'm going to pick out four observations about death that, that he makes here. That observations that really add to the frustration he's already feeling from the hardness of his life. Observations that add to our frustration in life as well. So, as we look at these four, I'll pick up our pace just a little bit, but... Four, four observations. Number one, death is meaningless. Death is meaningless. In verses 10, 11, and 12 here, the psalmist, he's expressing a, a number of rhetorical questions to God, assuming that he, our psalmist, will, will soon lie among the dead. He, he makes these rhetorical questions to make the point. And the point he's making is that, that God does not do anything for the dead like he does for the living. God's concern is with the living. God does not perform wonders for the dead. He performs wonders for the living. At the same time, God does not receive anything from the dead. The, the dead do not praise God. They, they do not proclaim God's loving kindness, his chesed here, that word we see in the Psalms over and over. God does not hear of his faithfulness from the, the dead. The dead do not praise God. Now, the psalmist is not denying an afterlife in these verses. Rather, he's making the point that, that meaningful actions and, and meaningful praise, those are oriented to this life. If God would answer his prayers, then the psalmist could praise God. Not answering means that the psalmist can do nothing of the sort. Instead, he'll end up joining those who are unable to offer God praise. Everything that the God has done for him, in fact, will soon be forgotten. Whatever the history is, it will soon give way to ancient memory. Number one, death is meaningless. Number two, death is allowed by God. That's the idea of verses 13 and 14. The, the psalmist is still crying out for God because he knows the, the Lord is the only source of help that could possibly stave off death. So on the flip side, that means death only comes when God allows it to come. And from the psalmist's perspective, it appears that God is allowing death to come his way. There, there's no relief in sight. As far as he can tell, God is not answering his prayer. Rather, from his perspective, God is hiding his face, ignoring the psalmist's cry, refusing to look at the one who's crying to him. Does that emotional anguish resonate with some of you? The, the question really that the psalmist is asking is a why question, not a how question. We, we all have enough theology under our belt to, to understand that death only comes when God allows it to come. The psalmist understands the how of death. How comes because God decrees it to come. 
is the punishment for sin and upon the earth and all that. He understands that theologically and so do we. His question is not how does death arrive, it's why. Why does God allow it to come into our lives? Especially into our lives by bringing upon those we love. That's when we really start asking the why question. We probably ask why death comes more often when it's for the one we love laying in bed than if we're the one laying in bed. Why, God? Why would you allow death? One commentator wrote, the, the depth of despair is most acutely experienced by those who have tasted the goodness of God and the closeness of communion with him. In other words, having tasted what God can do, we start wondering, why is God not doing? Having experienced what he can, we're most aware of the absence when God does not do what we know he is able to do. When our thought, theology does not line up with our experience. We know God can stave off death. How should we feel when death is allowed by God? Number three. Death is ever threatening. For the psalm, if the specter of death, it's been hovering over him for a long, long time. It's nothing new. He says in, that he has faced it from his youth onward in verse 15. It's an ever threatening companion in his life. Still, the, the closer something is, the more our attention is fixated upon it. And nothing can grab our attention like the threat of death. And the longer that threat hovers, the more death fills our every thought. Until we come to number four, death is all that's left. Death is all that's left. The last line of the psalm is hard to translate. If you compare English versions, you'll, you'll find some variation because the Hebrew is hard to translate. But what is clear is that the final word in Hebrew is the word darkness. This psalm ends with darkness. Most likely the idea is somewhat along the lines of God has removed all the friends from the psalmist's life. The only thing left is darkness. He might even be expressing the only friend I have left is darkness. When all else is gone, darkness alone remains. Darkness is now his closest friend. Darkness, the grave, that's all that he has left. This is an unhappy ending for life in the sin cursed world. It's an ending that the psalm leaves us with, re reminding us that eventually death is all that any of us have left. It's not a happy ending. This psalm does not have a happy ending. Death approaches. That's the second of two very harsh ideas we see in this psalm. Both ideas that are being thrown at God by our inspired psalmist. Number one, life is hard. Number two, death approaches. But remember, I said there's three simple ideas. Three simple ideas that, that we can learn from the psalm this morning. We, we've worked our way through the entire psalm, yet we've only considered two. We still have the third to, to think about. We need to learn one more thing before we can really grasp the, the fullness of what this psalm is, is teaching us. Life is hard. Death approaches. Keep praying. Keep praying. That's the final lesson of our psalm. Our psalmist is experiencing life as hard as it can get. He is fully aware that the death is approaching. He has had no hint that anything will change in either of these aspects of his life. Yet here he is praying. He is praying by day and in the night, according to verse 1. He is calling on God every day, according to verse 9. He is praying in the morning, verse 13. Life is hard. Our psalmist keeps praying. Death approaches. Our psalmist keeps praying. 
Every agony-filled word, every emotionally laden line of this psalm is a cry to God in prayer. It's a demonstration that, that he is praying to God. Prayer is the response of faith that we find displayed in our psalm. It's the response of faith regardless of the circumstances of life. There may be no hope, but there is prayer. There may be only death, but there is prayer. No matter what happens, the psalmist can commune with his covenant God until the final darkness arrives. As we think about this psalm, there's a few observations that, that we need to, to make. First, I... I like how, how one man expressed it. This, this psalm should teach us that the happy endings that, that we find so often in, in our psalms, these happy endings, they're a bonus, not a due. In other words, God does not owe us a happy ending to our problems. It's not like the sitcoms where within 30 minutes a happy ending will, will come about. God doesn't owe us a happy ending. We have no reason to expect that, that God will remove the, the hard things from our lives. In fact, the Bible teaches over and over, death is what we are owed. Death is the punishment that we are due because we are sinners. And death is the punishment for sin. It is appointed unto man once to die and after that comes judgment. The Bible's concern surrounds preparing us for the judgment that comes after death, not staving off death. That's why we celebrate Christ. Because Christ is the only way we can be prepared for the judgment after death. We need to have faith in Jesus Christ alone because we can do nothing to stave off death, which demonstrates that we can do nothing ourselves to prepare for the judgment that comes after death. If we could stave off death, then we could save ourselves. But we've attended plenty of funerals. No, that's not the case. We must have faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. He is the only way to be prepared for the judgment because God promises that when we accept Christ as our Savior, he will take the righteous life that Christ lived, a life that did not deserve death, and he'll apply that righteousness to us because of Christ. If you need to know more about that, talk to me. This is, after all, Easter week. It's the week that we celebrate the final events of what Christ has done where he came into the city of Jerusalem so that he could die on Friday and rise again victorious because he did not deserve to die. This psalm teaches that God uses the hardships of his life in the preparation process for the judgment. We have no reason to expect that God will give a happy ending to any of us. But we can commune with God. Through a relationship with Christ, we can commune with God. We can have a covenant relationship and call out to God so that we can keep praying no matter how hard life becomes. No matter how close death approaches, we can keep praying. We also need to recognize, number two, that, that God withholding a happy ending from someone is not proof that God is displeased with the person. Sometimes we fall into the same guilty ideology that the friends of Job displayed, where we think if God brings pain into someone's life, that's proof that God is unhappy with the person. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us clearly that, that God withholding happiness or giving hardship to a person is no proof that God is displeased. Suffering does not equate to God's displeasure. Just look at our psalm this morning. God wanted this psalm in his inspired word. God was not displeased with the psalmist. There, there's no hint of sin of any kind underlying the afflictions that this man experienced. Rather, God afflicted the psalmist for his own good reasons. Notice I, I say God afflicted him. The psalmist was right. Every time he accused God of bringing these afflictions on him, he was right. God is the ultimate source of problems. 
This psalm teaches us that suffering does not mean that God is unhappy with us. It teaches us that God allows us to keep praying when God afflicts us with suffering. A happy ending is not our due. An unhappy ending does not mean God is displeased. These are, are two observations that we need to understand. Regardless of what our future holds, we are to keep praying. Which, in fact, brings us to a third observation that, that I want us to make. This psalm teaches us that, that we can pour out the rawest of our emotions to our God. We can take our pain to our God. We can take our fears to our God. We can take our anger, our hurts, our frustrations, our disappointments. We can take all these things and we can cry out boldly to God. We can even share our confusion when, when life just doesn't seem to make sense. We can take that to God. When life seems unfair and cruel, we can tell God. Rather than offending God, such openness, these complaints to God in prayer, are encouraged by God himself through the simple fact we have this psalm in our Bibles. Our prayers do not need to be all sun and daisies. In fact, this psalm shows us that our prayers can be raw and dark. What God wants from us is to come honestly before him as we keep praying. Keep praying. The, the problem for many people lie in the fact that prayer is not really attempted until the hardness of life arrives. It, it's only as death approaches that people try and pray. The bottom line is, if you're not praying long before that, you will find it very hard to keep praying when life is hard and when death approaches. You'll find it hard to pray day and night, every day, using the words of the psalmist, praying like our psalmist. You will find it very hard because praying when life is like this requires building up a habit of prayer. We all need to keep praying now so that we are ready to keep praying when prayer is all we have left. Life is hard. Death approaches. Keep praying. We really don't have hymns in our songbook to express these ideas. In the raw form, Psalm 88 just expresses this, this hardness of life. But we do have this psalm here in our Psalter, this psalm that reminds us that no matter how hard life comes, it assures us that we are to keep praying. This psalm assures us that no matter how close death approaches, we are to keep praying. Life is hard, death approaches. Keep praying. Father, we come to you this morning truly thankful in our hearts for this psalm that pours out such pain and emotion because it shows us that we can do the same. Father, I do not know what each person here is going through at this moment, but I know with a crowd this side, there are some here who are going through deep, deep pain, deep, deep waters of, of trials, agonies of heart, discouragement, frustrations. Father, I pray today that they would see that you are the one that can bring all of these to you are ready to hear and receive the, the pain of our lives. You are our God. Father, if there is someone here that does not know Jesus Christ as Savior, that cannot say truly that you are their God, I pray today that you would help that person come to a saving knowledge of Christ so they too can bring their pain and agony before you, knowing you are the only one who can prepare them for what comes after the death that is truly approaching all of us. Father, you are a great God. We thank you for your word. Amen.
Thank you.